Philippians chapter 2. I'm going to read verses 1 through verse 8. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Let's pray. Jesus, I thank you that you were obedient. And God, as we look and as we've been looking at the humility, that attitude that we're supposed to pick up to obey, God, as we look at that, that we would see our need for you in our lives, not just for salvation, but for bringing this trait of humility seeing our need every day of you. Lead us, I pray, in your name. Amen. Amen. Going to the passage that we've been, been going through, and I'm going to skip the, those first four verses, but just again as review where we've been, talking about how the, the attitude in Christ, this humble attitude, which made him just continually give up of, of, of who he was. Now, he didn't give it up permanently. He just set aside. Um, and, and so how, how our attitude should be the same. And so we're, we're looking at what he did for us and, and, and the demands that he puts. And again, he is God, and we have to realize how high he is. And when we see how high he is and how low he went, um, how, how much humility we don't have. Um, and, and he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped that we could not comprehend. We could not grasp him. If he showed up as he is, everybody in the room would die. I mean, it's just him being that awesome. But instead, it says he made himself nothing. He literally emptied himself. Um, and, and so we're looking at these, some of the things. We've been looking at some of the things of what he emptied himself of or how he emptied himself. Um, and and so, so he stepped down. All these are stepping down. He stepped down in, in hu humility by, by stepping into service. He became a servant, literally a, a slave, taking the very nature of a servant. Uh, we, we looked at last week he, the step of identity where he became in human likeness, that he became human. Um, and we, again, we looked at all the details. If you missed it, go online to our YouTube show, channel and, 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 and watch that of just all the things he did in, in stepping down. And so in, in continuing that thought is the passage we're looking at in at, at verse 8 today. And that is being found in the appearance uh, as a man, he humbled himself. I mean, it was already a humbleness to become man, but then as a man, he humbled himself. How did he, how did he become humble? Became obedient to the point of death. That's obedience without, with no return. At least we think. <laughs> That's next week. 
even death on the cross. And so we've seen him take a step of, down to service, a step down of identifying, being made human, and now the step of obedience. And so as we look at this, I, I simply want us to look at the humility of, of Jesus' obedience, um, the degree of his obedience, and, and then finally the reason for his obedience. The humility of Jesus' obedience. Because it says, he humbled himself and became obedient. You know, when you, when you become obedient to something, that means you put yourself under. And, and what is Jesus under? I mean, he's over all. He's the creator of all. I, I want to think of it this way. Um, especially the children left the room. Um, when you're a child... You have a lot of rules that apply to you. Don't cross the road. Now later on, they're allowed to. They're old enough to make that decision, you hope. Um, and, 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 you know, or, or you're, you're not allowed in certain rooms, you know. You know, actually that never changes. But, but no, you know, there's certain, you're not allowed to go into to that room or, or, you know, you, you have nap time. Do you know, now we're all in the room. All the kids are gone, right? All right. Do you, you know what nap time's about? It's about mom and dad. <laughs> Whether they're sleeping or not up there, we're, you know, <laughs> you know, when we had little children, you know, that was, you know, it, was for, it wasn't for them, it was for us. But, but, you know, all these different things, a bedtime, all these things and stuff like that. I remember people looked at us, thought we were really weird and putting our kids to bed at 8 o'clock. And, you know, this time of year, it's still light, you know. And, and I, I, the only reason we did that was because I remember doing it. And I wanted them to be able to talk about that when they grew, when had, had their own kids. But, but now, now listen, can you imagine going to a grown adult and saying, hey, 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 don't, 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 don't cross that street. Like, I'm an adult. Across the street, no matter what you I mean, you know, don't tell me what to do. Um, I can make my own decisions. Well, you know, it's it, it's getting late. I think you should go to bed. Try that at home. Pastor Candy does that. You know, it's okay. <laughs> um, bed. In a similar way, there were a lot of things thrown at Jesus that he obeyed. That being who he was, there was no authority over him to tell him what to do. But he humbled himself. It's kind of like, and this is where I got the title of the message, Stepping Within the Lines, is, is it's kind of like, you know, when your kids and, and they got a coloring book, what do you tell them? Color within the lines. Yeah, tell that to Van Gogh or Picasso. You know, you know they, they don't tell me I don't even have any lines. I mean, I'm just free. I'm grown up. I don't need those lines. And so Jesus humility of Jesus. Now, let's just look at some of the ways. He submitted to the laws of God. Now, here's the, the truth is, it's not that Jesus is above the law. You could say that, but he's beyond the law. The law was based on him. He didn't even have to think about obeying law. It just was his nature to do so. Let's look at the commandments and Jesus. Know that God's before me. Jesus is the only true God. Do not have any graven images. He is the image of the invisible God. Don't say his name in vain. Well, his, he, he is, his is the name that is holy. 
There is no other name given among men whereby we are saved. Uh, later on in this passage it says, At his name every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. Keep the Sabbath holy. You're going to say, oh, I know he didn't. Okay, now listen, listen. He ceased the work on the seventh day by completing the work. And he was called the Lord of the Sabbath. Obey your parents. I mean, he set up, he's the one who created the family structure. And when he was a child, even when he became a son of, of, um, of the covenant at age 12, 13, he still submitted to his mom and dad. He could have said, hey, I, I'm, what, what are you, well, why were you looking for me? I was in my father's house. I'm with that dad now. I'm, you know, no, he didn't have that attitude. Do not murder. He is the giver of life. Do not commit adultery. He sanctified marriage. It pictures his relationship with us. Not steal. Let me ask you, what can Jesus steal? Especially with this truth. <laughs> he owns it all. <laughs> he can't steal. It's his. At, this will be the same one for covet too. Um, uh, but don't lie. Well, he's the truth. Don't covet. Well, how can he covet? He owns it all. In fact, he gave it all. So, you know, looking at Jesus, looking at him, him being, being um, under the laws of God, um, he did that. He, he perfectly obeyed the law. Because we couldn't. Later on, because he paid the price, we no longer are under the law. The law does not hold over us. And Paul talking about this. And this goes back to that humility. Paul, Paul says in 1 Corinthians, Though I'm free and belong to no man, I make myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. We're going to look at that in a couple months, you know. But, but he's just saying, listen, I, I, I am free, but I choose to do what Jesus did in Philippians chapter 2, who became a servant. And how did you do this? Well, to the Jews, I become like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I become like one under the law, even though I am not under the law. So as to win those under the law. That I'll, I'll submit under, I'll be under. I'll obey. So his obedience, he submitted to the laws of God. I'll go through these other ones pretty quickly. He submitted to the religious rules. And you're going, what's the difference? Well, here's a religious rule. Sacrifice. Why does somebody have to sacrifice? Because they sin. And Jesus, you know, we don't have any recording of this, you know, in the scriptures, but, but Jesus was part of the Jewish life. And I know that his mom had some sacrifices she had to do because, you know, she gave birth and all this other stuff. And he was part of the family and the family did stuff and all that. But listen, Jesus didn't have to do sacrifice because he would be the sacrifice. He submitted to the government's rules. He's the king of kings and lord of lords. And yet, he even says, I don't have to pay taxes. You know, he told that to Peter. But so we don't offend anybody, you know. Throw your line in, catch a fish, and inside would be your tax and my tax. Wouldn't that be nice right now? He submitted to the Father's will. Of course he did. That's his nature too. But in this time, the Son became a servant. And in the, and in the, the thinking about this last week of Christ, um, in Gethsemane, 
not my will. Father, if there's any way, if there's another way that this cup, this suffering that I'm going to have, if there's a- another way, but not my will. Yours be done. Let's look at the degree of Jesus' obedience. The degree of Jesus' obedience. I'm going to go back to the first man, and then Jesus comes as the second Adam. And so for Adam to be obedient, what did he have to do? He had to stay away from a tree. (laughs) That's all. You got all these other trees. Stay away from him. What did Jesus have to do to be obedient? He had to hang on a tree. For Adam to be obedient, you get to live forever. Talk about motivation. (laughs) You can live forever. Come to this other tree (laughs) and eat from it. You'll live forever. But for Jesus to be obedient, he had to die. For Adam to be and remain obedient would be perfect fellowship with the Father where in the cool of the day he would come and, and be with them and just, just if, if, he, if they didn't fall, they'd still be doing that to this day. For Jesus to be obey would mean he would be forsaken, not just of men, But as he said on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Because at that moment he was paying for my sin and your sin. And as some say, the father turned away because the price of sin is separation. For Adam to be obedient would mean to be ignorant of sin. For Jesus to be obedient, he had to pay for our sin. The degree. Adam had it easy to obey, and he didn't even have the sin nature yet, you know. It was very hard for Jesus to obey, yet he did it willingly. And then it says this. The degree, even death on a cross. He didn't just die. It it was the worst way to die. A Roman citizen um, could not be crucified because that was so inhumane. They can't do that to their own. Uh, The Jews considered someone to be cursed because they're hanging on on the tree. Uh, There was the most painful, the word, you know, crucified. We get the word excruciating uh, just to talk about the pain. Not only the most painful, but it was the most cruel because it wasn't just a short-term pain. It was sometimes hours if not days of agony and humiliating as some were naked if not just near naked hanging on the cross and many of them had a plaque on their on their cross to say what crime they've committed and even bearing their cross going to where they would die they were saying I deserve this, so I'm bearing what I deserve. Why did Jesus do that? There's so many times I just like, you know, in the, in, the, in the passion, the suffering of Christ, and I'm like, oh, Jesus, why didn't you do, you know, I know why, because he, he, he was going to die for my sin and your sin, but I just think about, like, when they're, when they're blindfolding him and hitting him and, and pulling his beard and all this other stuff, and they say, hey, who hit you, prophesy, oh, come on, Jesus, just once, come on, just to say, well, that was Fred, you know, and this was, you know, the next person, you know, I mean, he could have just, like, totally freaked him out, but no, he was silent. It's a lamb. 
to be sacrificed. As he's on the cross. Come off the cross. Save yourself. You know, and beats them all up. You know, you know that's my mind. Just got, he could have. And, you know, he could have done all that. He could have avoided the cross. But again, why? He loved the Father. And he loved us. That's why. He loved the Father and he knew it would glorify the Father. And I know I only went to verse 8. I'm saving those next verses, you know, and God highly exalted him and gave him the name of every name that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow and all. Okay, I'm not going to say all that. Um, you know, but at the start, at the very end, it says, to the glory of the Father. And he's like, God, this is going to give you the most glory. I love you and I want all this glory to you. And it would bring us salvation. Because I love mankind. I love God so loved that he gave. That's one of the reasons. Another reason was to be our sacrifice. To be our sacrifice. Now I'm going to use some words. Like, kind of like I kind of gave a little education on Calvary. You probably already knew that. Uh, just some words. We hear words, but we don't always know. I mean, it's just it's one of those religious words, like atonement. Yeah, he was the atonement. You know, well, what's that mean? You know, um, and, and so, so it, it literally means he covered. He covered our sin. It goes back to the Old Testament, the day of atonement. That, that his sin, that there was, there was a barrier between, that, that he took away the consequence of the sin. He took it out of sight, and it was done in two ways. There were two animals, two goats, and one goat they brought in and they sacrificed, and the blood went on top of the cover, the mercy seat. And it, it was symbolizing this. Inside the, 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 the Ark of the Covenant was the covenant. It, it, it was the Ten Commandments. It was all the things we do wrong. And this, this covering of blood where, where God dwelt right above that, you know, again, symbolically manifested that way. That when he looked to see how we've committed the sin, he saw the blood. It was covered. But the other picture of atonement is the other animal, the other goat, where the high priest would pray and would confess the sins of he and his people. And that goat would then be led out far, far, far away where it could never return. What a beautiful picture that, of, of that, that aspect of sacrifice, of atonement. That when God looks down, he sees the blood. It's covered. And that he has separated us from our sin as far as the east, the east is from the west. Here's another word. Substitution. You know, we know what that word means. You know, we've had substitute teachers. It means the real teacher isn't here. But, but here, here's the thing. He, he took our place. He who knew no sin became sin for us. That we could have the righteousness of God. He took our place so we could have his place. Redemption. You know, we sing all those songs, I'm redeemed, I'm redeemed, I'm redeemed. You know, like, what, does, what does that mean? He paid the price. We are sold into sin, sold into slavery. We, and he paid the price to free us. And the price, again, is always the same thing. What was the price for his, his atonement? Himself. For substitute himself. For our redemption. Himself. 
And the last word to use, and there's, there's others that are connected to sacrifice. This is that big one, propitiation. If you have a more, more literal translation, you'll find that occasionally in there, and you're going, I don't know what that means. But just, so he took our punishment. The idea here is our sin deserves God's wrath. He, just because of who he is, he is holy. And when unholiness is before him, and this is, a, this is an awful picture, but Jesus took our sins on him and the wrath of God came down on him and his wrath was satisfied that it is no more. Because he took our punishment. Now when I say he took our punishment, when he took, he covered our sin and all that, this is what is available because of what he has done for us. Have you received Christ and the sacrifice he has made for you? The reason... Because he loved God and he loved us. He, he, the reason of his obedience was to be our sacrifice and then to win our hearts. <laughs> he could have come to earth as a king and ruled us from day one. He could have dominated us we could have been forcibly ruled by fear. Even though he does dominate, <laughs> even though he does rule, even though he, he came not to dominate, but to serve. He came not to, to rule over us in like a dictatorial, but he, he came so we could know him. He came not to make us obey him out of fear, but out of love. He came not to force us to worship him, but choose to love him. Hmm. One commentary put it this way. Oh, one more, I'm sorry. He came not to judge us, but to be judged for us. One commentary um, Put it this way, Jesus won the hearts of men not by blasting them with power, but by showing them a love, a self-sacrifice, and a self-renunciation which cannot but move the heart. This is how, how Scripture puts it in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. For Christ's love compels us, it moves us, it motivates us. It compels us because we're convinced that one died for all and therefore all died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. That when we realize what he has done for us, we are compelled to say, you are Lord. You are my Lord. I will obey you. I may want to feel like doing this, but I want to do what you want me because you loved me so much. Here's how a couple songs put it. Charles Wesley wrote, and can it be amazing love how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? Uh, we don't do that one often. We do this one even less. O sacred head, now wounded. This is, I think, the last verse. What language shall I borrow? To thank thee, dearest friend, for this thy dying sorrow, thy pity without end. Oh, make me thine forever, and should I fainting be, Lord, let me never, never outlive my love 
for thee. And this next one, you know. <laughs> Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. He came out of love for the Father in us. He came to be our sacrifice. He came in such a way to win our hearts. <laughs> Humility. We've been talking about it for three weeks. It urges us to serve. Encourages us to, to relate. Leads us to obey. What motivates humility? What I just talked about. Love. Because we love, we put others in front of ourselves. This is, this is what motivated Jesus. And it can be what motivates us. But listen, we're nowhere near what Christ wants us to do in humility and to love so how, how do we love? By remembering his love and what he did for us. This is why we'll be concluding the service with the Lord's Supper to remember he gave his body, he gave his blood so we could have a relationship with him. Jesus, I pray that today from what your word has said and then as we reflect on what you did for us, our love would grow because you loved us first. And you give us the ability to love you back. Help us to remember what you have done. I pray in your name. Amen.